Tonight we wish to consider a most vital subject. Tonight we will endeavour to set before you the truth, the things concerning the Kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Particularly the Lord's Prayer, its vital message and future meaning explained. In the pages of the Holy Scriptures alone is where we wish to take all our references this evening. To undertake this presentation, there are a few key points we wish to answer to give structure to our considerations this evening. And so there's five points that we wish to cover. Firstly, who was the Lord referred to in the title, The Lord's Prayer? And who was he imparting this prayer to when he gave it? Secondly, where does the Lord's Prayer appear in the Bible? as well as those of the Gospel records, many of the key articles of the Lord's Prayer in 1st of Chronicles 29 and in verse 10, when David was imparting the kingdom to Solomon his son, handing over the throne when the kingdom of Israel was on the earth. Thirdly, why did the Lord give this prayer to his disciples directly and to all believers down through time to our day today? And what does the Lord's Prayer tell us about God and how we must approach him if we wish God to hear our prayers? Fifthly and lastly, when will the times prophesied in the Lord's Prayer come to pass? So within the structure of the Lord's Prayer is a vital message and this message is for all who come to understand the things of God. Now this well known and often recited prayer contains within simple words a splendour of vital and divinely appointed steps that one must understand when approaching the God of heaven and earth and observe these policies that are laid down in this wonderful prayer. To come to understand God and to know what his plan is for mankind from the Lord's Prayer tonight we wish to step through the Lord's Prayer and unlock and make plain some of the many instructing items that are bound up in this short yet concise and succinct prayer. So the breakup of the prayer in Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 through to verse 13. Starting at the very beginning of what our Lord spoke to his disciples. He starts the prayer with the simple words, Our Father. And so firstly here we are acknowledging and speaking to our provider and protector and our creator and all things that are noble and associated with a father who cares for his children. We know a father oversees and overshadows his children and a father has a very special relationship with his children and does pity his children. And in Psalms 103 and verse 13 we read, David recorded of this, this natural understanding of things from verse 13. Like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the memory of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, and upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto his children's children's, to such as keep his commandment and to those who remember his commandments to do them. So this psalm shows a complete distinction between God and man. Man is but dust and the flower that blooms and then dies and returns back to the ground from whence he came. However, God is everlasting and powerful. And if man in his lifetime has feared God and his righteousness and has kept his commandments and remembered to do his commandments, then God will also remember him from everlasting to everlasting, and raise him up to life again. So then this, the prayer goes on to say, which art in heaven. And so here we add to the picture of our Father. He resides in heaven, inestimable height and greatness than ourselves. 
and who are on the earth. The Bible tells us, as far as the heavens are above the earth, so are God's ways above man's ways, and God's thoughts above man's thoughts. And that's in Isaiah 55 and at verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so here we see that God is distinct from mankind, and he dwells in heaven where man dwells on earth. Therefore, the vital um, item we are being told right at the beginning of this prayer is that when we come to God, we must show respect. He resides in heaven and he is our father. The book of Ecclesiastes adds to this intended nature of our conduct in this relationship with our heavenly father by using the following concept. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and at verse 2. Be not rash with thy mouth. And let not thy heart be hasty to answer anything before God, for God is in heaven, and thou upon the earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. And so the prayer now goes on to tell us more about our Heavenly Father. Hallowed be thy name. Now here we come to the key understanding and the vital message laid out in this wonderful prayer. Hallowed be thy name. The name of our Father that inhabits heaven is separate. It is holy. His name tells us here that he is widely different from us. Yet we are still able to come to him and approach him as our Father. What an amazing privilege we have as being able to entreat the uncreate and everlasting true God of heaven and earth through prayer. And this is a marvellous and a wonderful blessing that we should never underestimate or become familiar with. This is the God of Israel uh, that we are speaking to, the King of Israel who built up the Jerusalem and will establish again the foundations of Zion. And this is the God that will raise up a multitude of people and recreate them as they were when they died with enormous power. This is the God who created all things and set out the span of heaven and earth. And he called the whole multitude of the stars by their individual names. So we should come to God and entreat him in our minds and with our attitude, with all the majesty, the dominion and power that he does deserve. And be sure that we rejoice and be thankful that we are able to call him our father. The Bible records the prayer of Hannah, also David's prayer when he abdicated the throne to his son Solomon. And in both of those prayers, they were thankful that they had a father that was real and not an idol, and they could sincerely seek him and entreat him and have answers to their prayers. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. Now here the Lord goes on to tell his disciples about God's purpose with this earth. Thy kingdom come. And here we are now directed to think on what much of the Lord in his ministry spoke of. And indeed the sum total of what the Bible leaves on record for man to seek out. Thy, it starts with, his our separate and holy Father's kingdom is to come. Thy will be done on earth. The will or purpose or the intention of our Father is to be done. The absolute majesty and the name of this holy and separate God or the intention of our Father is to be done with neither any help or need of help or to be hindered by mankind. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now we can see thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I wish to just read from a um, publication from a Bible scholar that was written some time ago. And I think it 
outlines to us a little more and shows to us how the attitude of man today is so different to what God has outlined in his Bible. The kingdom that the Lord Jesus Christ speaks of here or is, is describing to his disciples is by no means a democracy. It is a dictatorship and it is a kingdom with a king who rules supreme. And so this can conflict with some of the thoughts of today's democratic society. But I think this uh, small passage here I wish to read by a fellow Bible scholar who of course was not inspired but he did study the Bible quite a bit. And it puts into context man and its position before God I believe. Men not ushered into being for the purpose of being saved or lost. God manifestation not human salvation was the grand purpose of the eternal spirit. So it's telling us that God manifestation by God is his, in, his uh, supreme policy, not necessarily man's salvation. The salvation of a multitude is incidental to the manifestation, but it was not the end purpose proposed. And this is what the Bible does teach us, ladies and gentlemen. The eternal spirit intended to enthrone himself on the earth. And here the eternal spirit is alluding to, in its simple context for tonight, God. And in doing so, to develop a divine family from among men. Every one of them whom shall be spirit because of the power born of the spirit and that this family shall be large enough to fill the earth when it is perfected to the entire exclusion of flesh and blood. And so I think that puts quite concisely what the message of the Bible is in regards to God's kingdom without any uh, influence or input from man and his dominion when he reigns. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as it is in heaven and full stop. It also, there's another passage here I wish to also quote from, it's called The Herald of the Kingdom Age to Come, and it was a, a Bible scholar some time ago. God does not will all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. In the sense of compelling such, there is very few down through each generation that actually come to a complete and exact understanding of the policy of God. For there is only one hope, one God, and one truth, hope in Jesus Christ. The original words of Paul to Timothy, and this is in course in, in the context of the article, do not sanction such superstitions. Speaking of God, he says, who is willing that all men be saved and come to the exact knowledge of truth? For there is one God and one mediator of God and man, Jesus, a man anointed who gave himself a ransom for all. The testimony is its proper terms. And this is quoted from 1st of Timothy, uh, chapter 2, verse 4 to 6. And the proof of God's willingness is seen in his sending an invitation to all men, offering them the kingdom, the power and glory of which the gospel treats, the eternal life, the resurrection. And so there, when we look at thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It by no means is different from the purpose of God. Because God needs no help from man to establish his kingdom. I just want to quickly um, refer to this last part, on earth as in heaven. This really means that the order and the arrangement of God's will that is displayed and carried out in heaven is to be done here on earth in the same fashion as it is done in heaven. The prayer recorded for us goes on to tell us, this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to his disciples, give us this day our daily bread. And so here we are recognising that God has provided our food, our raiment and shelter. God is in control of this world. 
And Jesus is entreating his disciples and those down through the ages who are to follow and uh, come to an understanding of the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ are to come to understand that God is the provider of all things. And it is to him that we should earnestly entreat for our daily provisions. And the Bible records that God's hand is open. When God opens his hands, all flesh is fed. Now the prayer carries on. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now this um, record of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew is also in the other Gospel records, which are of Mark, Luke and John. And they record also this Lord's Prayer. And they include the words debtors, as we forgive those who trespass against us. But they use the word debtors in the uh, first trespass there. But this aspect of the Lord's Prayer goes on to explain to us that if we are to be recipients of God's bountiful hand in receiving our daily bread, then we need to not hold to account those who may have wronged us. For as we come to understand the Bible and in the sequential order of the Lord's Prayer, we can see, give us this day our daily bread. And so immediately we see the sustainment of life is by bread. But not just by bread, as in the physical food we eat, but the bread of life from the Bible. And so once we have come to the understanding that man is reliant on the word of God and he comes to understand the law of the Old Testament, he immediately comes to understand one vital fact, and that is man is of need of forgiveness. And so that's why I believe um, that the Bible has recorded the Lord's Prayer here for us, that the, um, after the, the giving of the bread, praying for bread, it immediately goes into speaking about forgiving of trespasses and highlights to us that man is in a state where he is of need of forgiveness. For we are very much in the deep debt of our Heavenly Father, and it is to him we owe our all and indeed our very existence and of course our hope for the future. And this passage of the Lord's Prayer ties directly into the next section, lead us not into temptation. And so as God provides us our daily bread, God forgives our trespassing. As we ask in our prayer, we also glorify him by asking that this mercy that continues to be bestowed upon us, that we be not led into temptation. God does not lead man into temptation, although he does try mankind. But James 1 verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And so here we can see, and we read over in verse 2 of uh, James chapter 1, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And in verse 12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to him that love him. And so there's a very, very clear distinction and a very careful distinction we must make here between God tempting man and God trying man. For we know God subjected the world to vanity in hope that man would carry out the commandments that he was given. So God certainly does try us. So here in this prayer we must understand that we are, um, when we are not being led into temptation, God does not lead man to be tempted but we are tried. 
and the fact that he does not lead us into temptation, we should be thankful of, that that is a characteristic of our God. In the same way, a characteristic of our God is that he provides bread for all of us. In the same way that he forgives our trespasses. And it's just a manifestation of us glorifying our Father by praying to him and thanking him for that. Uh, the prayer then carries on, but deliver us from evil. Here is not just in the context of maybe a, an accident by a vehicle or falling off a scaffold or something of some evil nature. This here, in these few words, is telling us something inspired and divine. It is a critical part of the Lord's Prayer and summarises for us in a few words what God has done through his Son in providing a saviour for mankind. That we might be saved from sin and death through the one he has provided if we remain in him. And the Bible goes to great lengths from Genesis to Revelation to describe this concept that one must remain within the house waiting uh, for our Lord to return. And he has provided a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And through him only is salvation. So God here has, we are thanking God here and directed by Jesus to thank God here, but deliver us from evil. And, and so the last section of the, the Lord's Prayer. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And again in these words, we, we see a uh, repetition of, for thy kingdom come. So here we have, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, and we see forever and ever. And the Bible here doesn't waste words. It is, in, it, it is alluding to a period after the kingdom age, when God's purpose on this earth, as set out in Numbers 14, 21, that he will fill the earth with his glory. The kingdom is to be established that this prayer is alluding to on the earth. And men will come to understand the true nature of God and his judgments, his policies. The words that are written in the Bible are so sure and firm to be relied upon, ladies and gentlemen, that it is alluded to in some very natural ways that we may understand. In the book of Isaiah, God is trying to show Israel that he will establish Israel in the kingdom as the first nation. And anyone who wishes to come and be involved in this hope will have to be in the hope of Israel, which is indeed the promises to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And Isaiah 49, three sections out of this chapter to describe God's love for his people even though that they had gone off like the nations around them and went off to idolatry and to be brought back and they even slew his son that he sent to bring them to an understanding of him and the prophets they chastised and killed as well but God tells us in verse 6 and he said, is it a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to restore the preserved of Israel? I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, as be my salvation unto the end of the earth. That the Bible's talking and its hope is bound up in that of Israel. We read on in verse 8, thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time I have heard thee, in a day of salvation I will help thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate places. And so here he's alluding to a saviour that he will provide so they can establish the earth and cause it to inherit the desolate places. And now he goes on and tells us something that any father or mother can understand and feel very clearly. Read in verse 15. Can a man forget her, can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on 
the son of her womb. Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have engraven upon the palms of my hands, and thy walls are continually before me. Thy children shall make haste, thy destroyers and they that make thee waste shall go forth of thee. And he tells us that he has engraven them on the palms of his hands and that the walls are continually before him. And it tells us in other places that from night to day his eyes are upon that land, speaking of course of the land of Israel. Well, what would this place be like, the kingdom age that we have alluded to in this prayer a number of times? Psalm 72, some of the judgments or the policies of this kingdom age. And it tells us in verse 1, Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the son of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endureth throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass, as showers that water the earth. And in his days shall the righteous flourish, and the abundance of peace, so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the rivers unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. And it goes on and tells us more and more in this, uh, this book of Psalm 72 of the policies of the kingdom age. A beautiful time when we read only in uh, Isaiah chapter 2 that uh, they will bend their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. But I also want to finish tonight on one last passage, ladies and gentlemen. And this is our home truth. This is in Ephesians and at chapter 2. And after coming to an understanding of the Bible, for the Bible is very clear about the terms on which we can come to approach our Heavenly Father. And I just wish to read from verse 8 of chapter 2. And for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God not of works lest any man should boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them therefore remember that ye are in times past Gentiles in the flesh, and that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in this world and without that hope of the commonwealth of Israel that God has bound up in his son, the saviour he has ordained. We have no hope. Thank you for your attention.